Let's make a D&D species. I'm sure a lot of you homebrew, and so this will be pretty quick uh, for those of you that don't homebrew uh, or have never thought about it or are interested in but don't know where to start. Uh, the basic idea to homebrewing your own game for the enjoyment of everybody at the table, which is kind of the key thing. You don't want to homebrew something that's going to ruin everybody's fo fun, and then you're not going to have anybody to play with. You want to make sure everybody's on board with whatever you're homebrewing. Because it's fun. And if it's not fun, if you start playing and you've got this new homebrew thing, whether it's a rule, a class, a species, whatever it is, if you start playing and everybody's like, you know, this kind of sucks, you can throw it out. Then you learn from your mistakes. Well, that's fantastic. So... Uh, the basic idea for uh, homebrewing a species is that you're running a fantasy world and uh, standard D&D &D or any of the source books don't have what you're looking for. Shock! In a universe of everything with everything that contains or is next door to multiple other infinite universes you can't find that one thing that you've come up with. So, you're going to want to homebrew your own species. And as a side note to anybody uh, watching that, uh, you know, uh, you really don't like species because it's not fantasy. Well, I, I can see your point. I would even agree with you. Uh, it doesn't feel like it would be used in a fantasy world. But I have this to say about it. So do you know, hear me hear me out. See, see if what I say makes sense. If not, cool. I'm the idiot. That works. Species is not inherently a word used in fantasy worlds. But we're not in a fantasy world. So as a top level outside the game looking at the mechanics and looking at just kind of the structure of things calling things a species for a category uh, is, I would argue, better. And I would also argue less racist or less prone to racism than uh, defining everything with the word race. Maybe. Um, so the people in the fantasy world will say, Ah, it's the dragon folk, or the elven race. Fine. You and I, talking about what category, well, I want my game, the base level mechanical unit, to be a uh, species. Now, you could say, as, uh, you know, Pathfinder does, ancestries. All right, uh... It doesn't, it doesn't preclude ancestries from being the same or different species. And that's their starting point. Cool. That's where they feel the most important information starts to come into play at that level. I don't, I don't particularly agree. I, you know, again, I grew up old school game stuff. So uh, my predilection is to start at like some type of... But that's, that's my own uh, science education upbringing b imposing onto the system. So again, there's nothing wrong with uh, ancestry or D&D uh, &D using species, but I've always felt D&D &D using race was weird. It never felt like elves and dwarves were a different race to humans as human races are different to each other. It didn't feel like it felt like there were too many biological factors like the 
you know, lifespans, m skeletal morphology. Just, it's like, these are different species. Would be my inclination. My first guess. So, anyway, that's a long-winded uh, story just to cut everybody off. If they go, uh, they like race better than species as the term. Uh, feel free to comment if you want, but uh, just I've said my piece, so I probably won't respond to anything about it because, yeah. What quagmires we create. Anyway, so you want to create a, a species for D&D &D to fit your... Uh, world. Well, the problem is, is D and D fifth edition, and whatever they're heading towards, looks like will likely be stay in the same vein, but maybe not. Fifth edition is there's a lot of uh, opaqueness to behind the scenes. That is to say, there's, it's very difficult to discern what the rules are for how things get made. Basically, you aren't allowed to watch, you aren't allowed in the kitchen well, as a DM or as a players. Uh, it's, it's why the, the CR, the challenge rating, uh, has been so contentious. Uh, because nobody knows what spreadsheet. I, I keep hearing I, they've got a spreadsheet. Wizards of the Coast has a, which to imply if you don't know. With the the rumor I hear is Wizards of the Coast has a spreadsheet that allows them to calculate how dangerous each monster is for a given adventuring party of whatever level they are, and that they've been using that. But they've been tweaking it because uh, there's been some wildly uh, different results that you would expect from um, combat with those creatures. Uh, all of which begs me to ask the underlying question of, like, even if they have a spreadsheet and they've got a formula for how it should work, and on the math, so let's say on the math, they've got that uh, uh, this creature should hit this AC 20% of the time. So, okay. And then, but how many times do they play that out? Like if they play it out once and the creature just wrecks the entire party... Are they going, oh, well, that didn't work? Because you'd have to play it thousands of times. You'd have to play that combat thousands of times to see if, on average, 20% of the time it hit. You know, so there's just... There, I don't know. Uh, game design is a science and an art. And uh, there are times when it is better to just go the artistic route. And then there are times where I don't know if it's better, but uh, where I get neurotic and uh, and I want to try to figure out the nuts and bolts behind the species. So uh, the 2014 Player's Handbook is what we're going off of and we're using as our uh, default. We're not jumping into Tasha's or Xanathar's or, uh, I don't know, other books that, that I've never bothered to memorize because, I don't know, uh, the group that I play D&D &D with is, uh, I would say, they're in it for the social. They, uh, they want to hang out with friends, family, you know, loved ones, and that's, that's, uh, that's top priority, and then playing the game would be, a, you know, a, a good second, maybe not close, but a good second. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then really playing the game, a far cry, like, I don't think that even really exists. 
Yeah, I think the one player that really got into it, into the into the game, uh, uh, left to go start his own game with his own friends. Which, you know, again, that's probably the best outcome of that. Like, it, no DM, especially, you know, it's a friend's... I'm, I'm getting lost on tangents. This is a tangential... I might not even edit it, just so you can see how... Uh, tangential it gets. Anyways, the D&D group that I'm gaming with started because two brothers wanted to get their kids into playing D&D, and so they asked me, a friend from back when we were kids together, if they if I would like to run uh, D&D for them. So that's when I jumped into 5th edition about two and a half years ago. I had taken a break, but I had pay, played... I'd been playing for... A while. Anyway, uh, also not that it matters. I mean, if you've played a year, or if you've played forty years, you, you know, either way, it, it's valued. Valued. Like, I I always distrust anybody that goes, "Well, I've been playing for forty years, and so that's that's how I know this is right." Like, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it just comes off arrogant and prickish maybe not always but i don't know there's just something that you know gets my hackles up that trying to you trying to use anything to claim authority like i have no authority here i'm just making a video on how i tried to make different species for my homebrew game which uh, uh may be helpful to you and it may not but thank you for watching. Anyway, so what we got here is a failure to stay on topic well. Uh, can't see behind uh, the, 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 the rules behind the rules, right? So you don't know why uh, they've decided that this will do this uh, instead of that, right? Like, uh, why did they choose the progression rate for uh, proficiency bonus to your character that they did. It's not explicitly clear. I haven't run across anything that said, eh, this made, you know, we found that this was the most, like even saying we found that this was the most fun out of different iterations, then that would, that would at least be some type of peek behind the curtain. Otherwise, it's just, that's how it works. So, uh, I went into all the races, or species, the cultural biases that we are taught are hard to uh, break out of. So what I did is I broke down, down the species in 5th edition. You can see here on each row that I decided I will give my species uh, species name. So, Colore Draca is the Latin because as an external uh, researcher into this fantasy world, I've, I've categorized the fantasy world. So uh, that is the, uh, you know, scientific name for the Dragonborn. Do the Dragonborn in my world know that? No, but I know it, and that's how it's categorized. So if some other researcher comes along, they go, oh, that's what that is, and then they could make, uh, you know, it can just be fun to use. Or not. But again, I said, oh, you know, a little, little neurotic. Anyway, so, uh, and then what I did is I uh, categorized some into endospecies. So endospecies would be uh, subspecies, but I don't like the word subspecies. I like endo, meaning within. So it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's within the species, this group. So you can have multiple you know, but if you're fine with subspecies, use subspecies. Then uh, here I've got meta race one and race zero, and uh, those uh, translate to ethnicities. Like maybe you could still use race, but race is just, it's just such a messy, wonky, wibbly wobbly word that's, you know, it's, it's largely taken over by jerks. So I don't know, ethnicities. So meta-ethnicity would be like using the United States, 
as an example, which, you know, it's always going to get weird. But you'll have the United States as a meta-ethnic culture, and then, you know, regional, southeast, southwest, north central, you know, culture, cultural milieu. So anyway, so I have three different types of ethnicities. Pardon the dog barking if that comes through. But so then what I did is uh, I broke everything down into biological and cultural traits because I felt like maybe maybe that'll be a distinction that I can tease out of uh, these rules. Uh, because, again, you don't get a good behind the scenes like uh, we'll get there. But uh, but then there's some things that I know that everything has in common. Uh, all, all the species have ability score increases. They all have a size. They all have a lifespan. They all have a walking speed, vision type, other biological traits. That's where I start teasing things out from their abilities. And so you can see here for Dragonborn, which are going to be the same across the two. Uh, I, you know, again, I split them into chromatic and metallic. Because then I wanted to see if in my campaign world I could make any further distinctions. And so this, I don't think, is it. Here you have size. Like, if you don't get a bonus or anything, there's no difference to small and medium size. Like, like it doesn't matter. You could just call them all medium, whether it's a halfling or a human. Because there's, there's no other bonuses. You, can, you know, there's no... No change to reach, no change to spacing on the map. There's there's no difference to size. So unless it gives you something, like if size gives you reach, then maybe that becomes important. Uh, then I split it up. I gave point values to lifespan. And I arbitrarily decided that uh, if human range, then that's average lifespan. If a little bit shorter than human range... Have I said what I'm doing here? Yeah, so I'm breaking up all the ability or all the all the parts to each species, giving them point values, and then seeing where that takes us um, to see how the points fit. And then if uh, if one species has more points than the other, then I look at what's going on between the two, and I adjust those point values as best I can to bring them into a closer value or into closer equilibrium between each other, because, at least for game mechanics, nice to, uh, you know, a player can go, oh, well, if I pick this, it's no no more powerful than this. It's just powerful in a different way. So then I go through, uh, average lifespan, no points. Base speed is, you know, and I use humans as the uh, baseline. So yeah, as the baseline, you know, medium size, average lifespan, 30 foot speed, no points. That's just, you know, that's what you expect. No points. They're the base. Uh, they have standard vision. Because of the way these points worked out, as I adjusted them, uh, I needed to make a standard vision a, a negative 10 points. And then once I did that, that started to help things get in, into line. For uh, cultural traits for humans, and for most things, like, there were only a few things that really came up as, oh yeah, that, that could be considered something that anybody growing up amongst these people would gain this, this ability. So, I'll show an example in a second, but so... If all you get is common, then minus 5 points, but a bonus language is, in, is 10 points. And then, um, you yeah, know, plus one to all ability scores. I can't remember how I did that. For dwarves, cultural dwarven combat training. I don't, I don't see how any dwarf baby is just intuitively knowing dwarf combat training. It's not like it's, uh, it's with use of physical weapons. Like if all dwarves had, you know, badger claws for hands when they came out then you know i could see an instinctual ah they know how to use their badger claws but coming out and you know how to instinctually it's that just 
that stretches my uh, willing suspension of disbelief to the point where it snaps and I think it's stupid. That's the feeling I get from uh, dwarven combat training being a biological trait. No. Uh, tool proficiencies, again, it, that just feels like something you would learn, which would then be a part of your culture. Uh, dwarven toughness, I think that one, uh, you know, I think it could go either way, if I remember correctly. Yeah, dwarven toughness, your hit point, incre your hit point total increases. And that very easily, you could say it's something where the culture of dwarves in your campaign... Uh, you know, does the whole uh, uh, Sparta thing, throwing the kids out into the wild to survive, and uh, makes it makes them m m more tougher. Or you could say that it's a biological, and it's just you know something about their physiological makeup makes them uh, be able to take more damage. So, uh, yeah, all of these things, like e even dark vision. You could say that there's some rite or ritual that the people go through uh, when you reach a certain age or at birth that bestows dark vision on the character. Then that would be a cultural trait and not a biological trait. So, yeah, I think I got lost in the weeds when I was doing that because it's just like, eh, you could do, you could do it for anything. Uh, you could, you could, you can argue it either way, but. Uh, it's always nice to try to have some reasoning behind it, right? And so then the point totals for that became here. So you can see uh, Dragonborn, Hill Dwarves, Mountain Dwarves. I have Orcs, and they all have these points, which then means I, I tried to come up with a system where then uh, players could then spend points. So I could never get all the core book species to match perfectly like without doing something really wonky like that, that wouldn't make sense right um like uh, making a bonus language you know some weird value and then and making the the half elf skill ability they get the ability for skills i forget what it's called but uh you know giving that some weird out there kind of point total I can't remember what the minus 5 minus 20 minus 50 is on this because I think I stopped using that maybe but I think these are the updated or no this is just uh, yeah this is sorted by highest point to lowest point so in my fantasy world I decided that uh, elves orcs and humans are same species and there are different endo species or subspecies. And so then that allows for half orc elves. And then um, I also decided that uh, goblins, gnomes, goblins, gnomes, and uh, halflings are similarly the same species. And they're each an endo species, a subspecies within that. So then you can have, and then I decided, you know, that and their offspring are viable. So you can have half goblin halflings. Or half goblin, half gnomes. Side tangent right here. So uh, we'll probably cl try to clip this out and make it its own video at some point. So it's a, a separate thing. But uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sound and fury out there about uh, Wizards of the Coast removing half elves. Now, I think that if they remove the option to play what is currently called a half-elf uh, or a half-orc. I personally, I don't agree with that. I, th I think that shouldn't be done. Renaming it, yes. Uh, the history of the use of the term half-something is terrible. I was writing my the, the, the campaign book that I'm about to uh, publish and put on, uh, uh, put on uh, RPG drive through is my plan. Uh, I had, I don't know if I've taken it out because I get too verbose, obviously, but, you know, I had a section in there going over how uh, the use of half to describe a person regarding their heritage is bad. It's racist. Um, it comes from racist roots. Maybe you're not, 
you know, if you say my friend is half white, half black, that's kind of descriptive. But if you just go, my friend's half black, why you got to signal out the black? Why did, why did they single out the black? Because racism and slavery and, you know, drops of blood and, and uh, you know, what, you know, three-fifths of vote and all of that shit. So totally, like, half is bad as a term. Getting rid of the the, the characters, uh, the, the playable, uh, that's the problem. You can't really call them species at that point because then you're, you're definitely acknowledging there's heritage, ancestry, subspecies relation between an elf and a human or an orc and a human which would then also which is why in my camp like long before like i've this is a second iteration of a fantasy world that i had been working on which was so this is literally the third iteration of a fantasy world i've been working on for 20 years just putzing around playing with it and the current version is made to be system agnostic, so you can play in Pathfinder, you can play in what you call it. But uh, it was clear 10, 20 years ago that the use of half and the use of race, not a great thing for the role-playing game. And it's, you know, and it's definitely, it's coming around. And if it doesn't change, if, if we don't change then uh yeah we're on we're on the bad side so anyway uh in my campaign world uh what i've done is that for the uh the offspring the children the people born of two uh, uh different endo species in the world the people call them bifolk i like the i like bifolk I feel that uh, on a meta level, it 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 uh, it's positive towards LBGTQ plus, and then I also feel that uh, uh, you know it, it it feels a little almost like saying bifrost, which is fun, but it's bifolk, so B I F O L K bifolk, because they're 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 people of two different uh, people. Which, I mean, we all are. But hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And uh, if, if, you, if you're playing in a game it, where the fantasy world never got concerned about, uh, you know, how much, how much of one ancestor you are versus another then you would assume that it wouldn't really come to be a disparaging term it's just oh bob's mom is an elf and bob's dad is an orc cool so that's the side thing uh stop using half because it's it has bad origins okay so that's end of that side thing but I needed that to explain why there's half goblin halflings in this table. So that's how I uh, designed uh, the playable species uh, that weren't in the core player's handbook. This way, they uh, I kept them as close as possible to the standard core book, player's handbook. And then on top of that, uh, it, in going through the core species, I found that mountain dwarves, mountain dwarves were the most, most strongest, so to speak. Um, they were the most powerful. And there was almost nothing I could do to get them back into line that wouldn't screw up something else. Like if I adjusted one thing on a mountain dwarf, then anybody else with that thing also got adjusted and that threw everything way off. Or uh, it was something only Mountain Dwarves had, but it wasn't that powerful. So why am I justifying making this an 80 point or, you know, a 10 point? Or it is, or, or what it is, is it was pretty powerful. And other species have uh, the same or similar abilities, but Mountain Dwarves just had more. And so it's like, I don't know what to do. Uh, but yeah, so, so that, so that's what I did is 185 points. 
Now it's about the scale, right? So forget, what's the average of this? Let's just take the average of the core. Anyway, so yeah, as you can see, I have minotaurs, gnolls, ogres, orcs, and goblins as playable species. So the average is uh, 157 points, build points, we could call them, you know, uh, uh, character points, uh, character species points, species points, SPs. Anyway, and your average human is 145. So, yeah, the average is 10 points plus better than the average human. So then what I did is, because I was because I broke everything down and gave it point values and then and then used breaking it down to make it consistent across all abilities. So if if one species had an ability that you know affected A, but otherwise its mechanics were this, this other one affected B, but its mechanics were exactly the same, and A and B were. Uh, equally likely to occur in the game roughly then they'd be the same points great and so now I have an itemized list of everything that gives points then I expanded across that to kind of help flesh other th other things out and then there's now I've now there's a list of abilities and with that list of abilities your character could then I you could the DM could then say, okay, when you create your characters, you have 200 uh, build points. A Mountain Dwarf is 185 build points, which means you'd have 15 build points left over, species points left over, to spend however you would like. And then you can look over the other abilities, and it's I think one of them is like, oh, you actually do physical damage or increase a die to an, to an unarmed attack, you know, or you could you could get an extra language or two. You know, things like that. So, yeah. So if you do a Mountain Dwarf, you, most of your choices are already taken away. And then if you played a Dragonborn out of the, you know, core book, then that that would give you the most points. Because they don't get a lot. And I know Breath Weapon is really cool and everything. But, I mean, otherwise, like, that's all that they are, right? Like, that's all, like... There's no, there's nothing else you get. You get, you get damage resistance related to your breath weapon, and you get a breath weapon. And then after that, it's all just physical description. It's like, oh yeah, and you look like a dragon. Again, that's cool, but there's no, there's no meat to Dragonborn in D and D. There's no, there's no ability that gives you an idea other than the breath weapon in it so it just feels you know one hit wonder type of type of species and and I was never really on board with the dragonborn when they were first introduced which I think was fourth edition and uh, it just it, it just felt like it felt like pandering to a very specific crowd and it felt like obvious pandering which I didn't like but then now that it's been in the system and been acknowledged for as long as it has. Now it's at least got some some player infused culture to them that that helps helps me go cool. And I wanted this system to be or I wanted my fantasy world to be system agnostic so that the new players, especially the kids, could pick anything they wanted and I wouldn't be like, "Nope, can't play that because I don't like, you know." So it's like anything they wanted to play is available and then once I made that choice then how does this world work and then fill that out but that's a whole story for a different time so that's my suggestion yeah there's been a lot of breaks in this so this probably won't make an hour which is good because I don't think anybody wants to listen to me ramble for an hour and I'll do some minor cuts and I'll probably uh, block out maybe the specific meta race and race which are actual ethnicities, uh, names, when I, uh, when, I, when I put this up. So uh, here's the, the, the traits tables that I ended up putting everything in. Uh, as you can see, th this is the final version that I came, that I settled on. You know, again, 
Can't see exactly what Wizards of the Coast decided when they did it. Don't know. Don't I'm not. I don't have access to that information. If it is out there, I'm not aware of where it's out there. And uh, frankly, I spent so long on this that it feels like if there was a really good rationale behind all of these things, it would have become visible. Possibly it didn't. I'm not saying I automatically would discern the pattern because I'm not that bright. But if it if it was, then I feel like there'd be a higher chance. And it, it doesn't feel like there'd be as much of a swing between the point values between the species. So, here's the traits table. The starting for the ability score traits. Uh, so, if you give a character a... If, if you, as the GM, are making a species and you give them a plus one to an attribute of... of it, of your choice, but it's always that attribute, then it's 25 points. But it's, but that, no, I'm sorry, flip that. If uh, the player gets to choose where to put that plus one, then it's 25 points. If you determine that all, all members of this species for the player characters always have to put it into strength or charisma or whatever, then it's cost 20 points or you, you're building 20 points. Uh, if it's a penalty, then it's minus 15 if the players get a choice, and minus 20 if they don't get a choice. And then this goes on, and you can see how, like, uh, if you if you get advantage on attack rolls, you gain advantage on attack rolls around half of the time. For example, when in sunlight. So if you did the opposite of uh, drow, where in sunlight they have disadvantage, but this creature gets advantage in sunlight that would be uh, 64 points for the character build. And again, you're looking at uh, capping uh, capping species at around 200 points. So uh, if you want players to have no bonus points to spend afterwards, then build up to exactly 200. And if you want uh, characters to uh, have a lot, then uh, try to avoid 200 aim for 150 145 because that's about where the the human lands so then a player character so a human could come in and go oh you know what uh i want my character to have advantage on attack rolls you know when it when it's a full moon you know three days around the full moon or uh when i'm outside in the rain i get an advantage well that's 30 32 points and you and, and a human could take that the mountain dwarf couldn't, but you could swap out something from the mountain dwarf and add it in. All of which is, uh, you know, great and also take with uh, a grain of salt. You know, if you get, none of this has been play tested. You know, this is this is best fit and then extrapolating out from that. So, I think the best fit. Uh, disadvantage on skill checks major. No, disadvantage on attack rolls major. Yeah. Disadvantage. Let's see. I think Drow are in the player's handbook, right? Yeah, so Drow have disadvantage on attack rolls. Disadvantage in sunlight. Right? So that's negative 12. Oh, no, major. Here's the major. That's saving throws. So that's 16 points. And then disadvantage on one type of skill check around half the time, which is the percep perception checks. So uh, that's, what, 24? So that's 24 is a negative 24 penalty to the build points, you know. So it gives a drow 24 points to spend elsewhere. But the disadvantage on attack rolls major is the opposite of the uh, attack rolls advantage on it and uh, so I decided that about four times having advantage in sunlight is about four times as powerful as disadvantage when in sunlight is negative if that makes sense so that that that's why like usually if if something in in the system when I'm doing this because it's like oh okay uh, advantage on attack rolls to make the drow work, 
and fit as close as I could get the drow into that point, in, into matching point system with the other species, uh, negative 16 to the attack rolls for the, the sunlight sensitivity, and another 8 for the skill check in sun, sunlight sensitivity, uh, was the, the best fit I could come up with at the time. Maybe I could do better now, but uh, I don't care. I'm kind of happy with this until, you know, playtesting to figure it all out. But so, sure, a 16 for disadvantage when in sunlight. Okay. You know, I feel like it would be worse, but maybe not. Yeah, so the DM could adjust their point value for campaigns that differ from the average campaign. This is a key, key point in all of this. But yeah, so it just feels like in a standard game, in your average D&D game, if your traits, sunlight sensitivity is going to come into play, then to do the opposite, sunlight boost, you know, a creature that is, you know, you could play a plant, plant species, you're, you're making a plant species, and uh, you get a, a, a advantage on attack rolls when you're in sunlight, all that photosensitive synthesizing i'm sorry i got lost thinking that might be a fun build to just do you know i'm looking at 6432 is oh but you'd have to do it for all three or all the ability saving for, anyway so yeah just building a plant creature that's that's no uh, attribute bonuses all average you know what you call it uh age height size and but all but getting advantage on as much as you can take because when they're in sunlight and just seeing if that would that would be fun or not anyway so yeah so the the multiply the disadvantage by four to get the get what the value would be for uh getting advantage on it and that's a that seemed best fit but you know that might be going way overboard because a lot of adventures happen in dungeons and in taverns and outside of the sunlight i mean and even then you know half the time being sunlight it can be uh depending on your campaign might not be true so uh yeah it's whatever is actually half the time like in my campaign a lot of time is spent out in the wild there you go. That's uh, that's one way to to create a system so that you can just make uh, any species you want to add to your campaign. Yeah. So uh, with that said, uh, let's go and look at uh, Minotaur just to see what I've done so that if you wanted, you could try using uh, Minotaur in your game. Uh, the assumption on these Minotaurs is that they are an actual species. They are a people, a mortal species in the world. Maybe a more they they would be called a mortal race, a a you know a mortal folk of people that outside of it today we would be able to identify them as a species of people. Several ethnicities, several different cultures. Uh, that if that the species like humans, you know, there's a bunch of different versions of them uh, running around in the world, uh, being communities with each other and with other species as well. If you're in a world where there are other sentient and sapient species that are tool using and creating cultures, then either uh, though either they're going to be constantly at war or they're going to learn to cooperate or some version between the two and it's probably a spectrum so that's how this world basically is there's a lot of uh integration of peoples in various tribes and kingdoms and you know so these minotaurs the the you know the philosophy from which i am making this particular version of a minotaur is it's a biological species that has several different cultures and that it exists in a world where uh, elves, humans, and orcs are within our subspecies within one species and gnomes, goblins, and halflings are also 
uh, the, of the same species. They're subspecies or endospecies within one species. Uh, it also where there are dragonborn. So there's there's all these species, dwarves, elves, etc. There's all these species, and minotaur are just another one of those species. So uh, the thing to do is to walk away from uh, the legendary our world, real world meaning of minotaur you know the monster in the center of the maze with with the bull head these are a a species of uh, bovine headed bovine-esque humanoids and so i have two um two different uh what do you call it endo species of minotaurs i have long horned minotaurs where uh all the uh the horns of minotaurs are uh, non-gendered. Both, all genders of minotaur have horns. Uh, there could be cases where a minotaur doesn't grow horns, but the you know uh, the statistical range on average is the minotaurs uh, have horns, and so the longhorn has very long horns compared to the uh, woolly minotaurs who uh, have shorter horns but are, what do you call it, yakford. They're, 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 they're sheepdog. Maybe not sheepdog because I forget what dog is very sheep-like. But a sheepdog is one that cor- corrals sheep. Anyway, so here you go. Plus two to strength, plus two to constitution, plus one to charisma. Uh, medium size, average lifespan, so they, they live about as long as humans, plus or minus. Uh, 40 foot base speed. Uh, they have standard vision, so they, they don't have dark vision. Uh, in other games, I would give them low light because uh, they see better in the dark than humans. I gave uh, them all a gore. So they have a, a standard attack that for the Longhorns do 2d6 points of damage and for the Woolly Minotaur uh, does 1d8. Uh, they have improved natural armor, which is an ability, you know, which is a, a point thing that I've made up that for a plus one, it costs 10 points and for a plus two, it costs 30 points. So, you know, their skin and fur makes them thicker and gives them uh, some natural armor. Uh, I also gave them keen smell. I forget if that's advantage or a plus to, um, to perception checks regarding with smell or smell things. And then Longhorn, I, uh, at least in this version, I created a Longhorn combat training, which would be a lot like the Dwarven combat training. And for the uh, woolly minotaurs, uh, much like the, I think, gnomes, forest gnomes, and uh, maybe an elf, uh, nature's cantrip, they get one, uh, I believe, uh, druid or ranger, I can't remember for it. I haven't, I've never played 5th edition, maybe once long ago, uh, just one session in 2014, and mostly making characters. But otherwise, yeah, I, I, I've never played, so that's why I don't have a lot of the classes memorized, because I don't need to. I mean, you know, it would be better if I did have them all memorized, and et cetera, et cetera, but uh, these days I'm more focused on just having fun, so uh, I'm not worried about being a master at the, at the, at the rules. And then on the other hand, I break down each one of the, the core species into their component parts to try to give them a point value so that you can build any type of species that you want. I don't know. There's no logic or reason. I'm just a human with emotions. Anyway, so uh, nature uh, cantrip is a woolly minotaur uh, cultural trait. They're taught that as uh, children because in the game world, most woolly minotaurs are... Uh, living closer to nature than uh, most of the longhorn minotaurs. Or longhorn minotaurs also, there's quite a, I'd say most of the minotaurs living in nature, uh, tribal societies over uh, urban societies. And uh, 
So there's a few Minotaur in the urban societies, a few cultural groups in it. But most uh, are in tribal societies. And as such, the woolly Minotaurs, one of their cultural things that they've uh, passed along through their culture is the nature of their cantrip. That would be, that's the, the reasoning behind that. So, yeah, there's a Minotaur for you. Uh, hopefully it doesn't break anything, and if it does, just fix it. Yeah, you know, if, if you find that, that uh, I don't know, the 40-foot base speed is way too fast for them, get rid of it. Make, uh, make 40-foot base, make, uh, make speed increases cost more so that uh, they can't get it. And, uh, and yeah, so, uh, and then clearly, if you're between, like, 140 to, what was it, 140 to 185? Yeah, so if you build between 141 to 185 in this system, then, um, then you're within range of the, the, of all the core player's handbook species. So hopefully it fits. Anyway. Uh, I hope that was this, I hope this is fun for you, or that was fun for you, now that we're at the end of the video, or at least I think I'm at the end if I don't ramble too much more. Uh, have a wonderful day, like and subscribe if you're new here, uh, welcome, um, this is just me rambling, and this is probably the most rambly I've rambled in a real long time, so I think some of my other videos are a little more tighter, but probably not by much. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, enjoy, uh, game well. Uh, may your roles go in a way that are fun and exciting. Mm -hmm.